வணக்கம் வெல்கம் டு திஸ் செஷன் ஆஃப் த ஹேண்ட் சர்ஜரி குவிஸ் த ஃபன் வே டு லேர்ன் ஹேண்ட் சர்ஜரி question number 1 a wrist pa view x-ray is centered over the lunate capitate scaphoid or triquetrum and the correct answer is the capitate the exact positioning for an x-ray wrist pa view is as follows the patient is seated alongside the table the affected arm is abducted to 90 degrees at the shoulder and flexed at 90 degrees at the elbow and the forearm is completely pronated so that the shoulder elbow and wrist are all in the same transverse plane so the radius and ulna will be parallel the hand is placed palm down on the image receptor the hand is perpendicular to the central beam which is centered on the mid wrist that is the capitate bone question number 2 lag screws are most useful in comminuted fractures transverse fractures oblique fractures or compression fractures and the answer is lag screws are most useful in oblique fractures the principle of lag screws can be implemented in two ways one by design and two by technique let us try to understand this some screws achieve a compression by their very design this partially threaded screw acts as a lag screw by virtue of its design even if the screw is fully threaded it can act as a lag screw and achieve compression by using the technique of lag screw fixation whether by design or by technique lag screws achieve compression and absolute stability on the hand they are usually used for the fixation of simple fractures such as a spiral or oblique fracture they can also be used under specific circumstances to compress large fracture fragments of a comminuted fracture for providing added stability such examples of spiral or long oblique fractures are ideal for lag screw fixation a minimum of two screws must be used which means that the length of the fracture zone b must be at least twice the diameter of the metacarpal bone where the fixation is being done in case of a shorter fracture line or a short oblique fracture a single lag screw may not be enough and a protection plate must be added and it is important that each lag screw must be inserted perpendicular to the fracture plane in spiral fractures naturally the result is that the screws follow a helical disposition question number 3 the volar vy advancement flap for fingertip is ideally indicated for lateral oblique amputations transverse amputations volar oblique amputations or dorsal oblique amputations and the correct answer is volar vy advancement flap for fingertip is ideally indicated for dorsal oblique amputations the orientation of the amputated fingertip is of three types this is the dorsally facing amputation or the dorsal oblique amputation this is the transverse amputation and this sort of amputation which faces volarly is called the volar oblique amputation the dorsal oblique amputation is the ideal defect for the volar vy advancement flap whereas the transverse amputation is the ideal indication for the bilateral vy advancement flaps of cutler question number 4 the broadest annular pulley on the finger is the a1 pulley a2 pulley a3 pulley or a5 pulley
and the correct answer is the A2 pulley. The A1 pulley is over the metacarpophalangeal joint. It has a length of about 7.9 millimeters. The A2 pulley over the proximal phalanx has an average length of 16.8 millimeters. This is the most important pulley as far as the biomechanics of the tendons are concerned. The A3 pulley over the proximal interphalangeal joint has a length of about 2.8 millimeters and the A4 pulley over the middle phalanx has a length of 6.7 millimeters and the A5 pulley over the distal interphalangeal joint has a length of 4.1 millimeters. Question number 5. The dolphin procedure is a method of surgical treatment for the following condition. Butonia deformity swan neck deformity, mallet deformity or intrinsic plus deformity. And the correct answer is the dolphin procedure is a method of surgical treatment for butonier deformity. In butonier deformity there are two main problems. First is flexion at the PIP joint and second is hyperextension at the DIP joint. The pathology causing flexion at the PIP joint is the injury to the central slip. The pathology causing the hyperextension at the DIP joint is twofold. One is volar displacement of the lateral slips at the level of the PIP joint and subsequent contracture of the oblique retinacular ligament. Of these two deformities, the more debilitating is the hyperextension at the DIP joint. This can be corrected by tenotomy of the extensor tendon over the middle phalangeal region. This is referred to as the dolphin or the fowler procedure and it is done when patients mainly complain about hyperextension at the DIP joint. The incision on the extensor tendon should be performed distal to the insertion of the central slip in both the procedures. In dolphin's description, the tendon is divided a little more proximally when compared to the fowlers in order to preserve the distal insertions of the oblique retinacular ligament. Whereas in fowler's description, the incision is a little more distal. Question number 6. The lateral arm flap is based on the lateral recurrent radial artery posterior radial recurrent artery, posterior radial collateral artery or the posterior ulnar recurrent artery. And the correct answer is the lateral arm flap is based on the posterior radial collateral artery. The profunda brachii artery after leaving the spinal groove divides into two terminal branches. The anterior radial collateral artery and the posterior radial collateral artery both of which take part in the anastomosis around the elbow joint. But the posterior radial collateral artery supplies multiple perforators to the skin on the distal aspect of the lateral arm and forms the vascular basis of the lateral arm flap. The size of this artery is 1.5 to 2 millimeters in diameter and the vein about 2 to 3 millimeters in diameter. This vascular pedicle runs in the lateral intermuscular septum accompanied by the posterior antibrachial cutaneous nerve. This man's name is associated with hand surgery but gained esteem for treating Napoleon Bonaparte's hemorrhoids. Sterling Bunnell, Guillaume Dipitron, Guy Fauché, Andreas Vesalius. And the correct answer is Guillaume Dupitron. Baron Guillaume Dupitron was a French anatomist and military surgeon. Although he gained much esteem for treating Napoleon Bonaparte's hemorrhoids, he is known today for his description of Dupitron's contracture, which is named after him and which he first operated on in 1831 and published in The Lancet in 1834. There are a few interesting points about his career. He was appointed prosector at the age of 18 years, that is, a person who dissects dead bodies for examination or anatomical demonstration. At the age of 34, he became professor of operative surgery. He was a brilliant teacher, an astute diagnostician and a gifted surgeon. 
and he was extremely critical of students and colleagues who failed to live up to his exacting professional standards. Question number 8. The flexor retinaculum forms the roof of the Gans canal, the floor of the Gans canal, the medial wall of the Gans canal or the lateral wall of the Gans canal. And the answer is the flexor retinaculum forms the floor of the Gans canal. Gans canal is a semi rigid longitudinal canal in the wrist about 4 cm long, beginning proximally at the transverse carpal ligament and ending at the aponeurotic arch of the hypothenar muscles. The roof of this canal is formed by the superficial palmar carpal ligament. The floor is formed by part of the flexor retinaculum and the origin of the hypothenar muscles, the pisiform bone and the proximal portion of the pisohamate ligament form the medial wall of the Gans canal and the lateral wall is formed by the hook of the hamate bone. Question number 9. Fibrosis resulting from nerve injuries has been classified by McKinnon, Lee Delon, Humphrey or Millesi. And the correct answer is Millesi. Various degrees of reaction fibrosis occur following trauma to a nerve and these have been classified by Millesi. Type A refers to involvement of the epifascicular epineurium which has a good prognosis. Type B fibrosis involves the interfascicular epineurium which has a guarded prognosis. Type C fibrosis involves the endoneurium hence a poor prognosis. Type N fibrosis corresponds to the Sunderland 4th degree injury where the epineurium is continuous but infiltrated by neuroma and type S fibrosis also corresponds to Sunderland 4th degree injury which is maintained only by scar tissue. Question number 10. The classification of the thumb hypoplasia shown in the x-ray would be type 3A, type 3B, type 4 or type 5 and the correct answer is type 4. The history of the classification of thumb hypoplasia is very interesting. It was Müller first in 1937 who gave the concept of a teratological sequence of thumb hypoplasia with increasing severity from mild deficiency to thumb absence. Bloth in 1967 classified it from type 1 to type 5. Mansky and McCarroll in 1992 subdivided type 3 of the Bloth classification into types 3A and 3B and Buck Gramco in 2002 modified the Bloth classification further by adding a type 3C. Generally, Type 1 refers to a slightly smaller thumb. When there is a small thumb with a narrower first web space, an unstable metacarpophalangeal joint with a deficient thenar musculature, it is referred to as type 2. When along with these findings of type 2 hypoplasia thumb, there are also extrinsic tendon abnormalities with metacarpal hypoplasia and a stable carpometacarpal joint it is classified as type 3A. If along with the extrinsic tendon abnormalities, there is an absent metacarpal base and a carpometacarpal joint instability of the thumb, it is classified as type 3B. And if almost the entire metacarpal is not developed and only a remnant of the metacarpal head remains, it is classified under type 3C. When the thumb is just a nubbin, and has no bony connections or joint connections with the hand. It is called the type 4 thumb or the floating thumb and complete absence of the thumb is classified under Bloth type 5 hypoplasia. I hope you enjoyed this session of the hand surgery quiz, the fun way to learn hand surgery. Please comment on whether you found it difficult or easy and most importantly whether you found it useful. And please scan this QR code with your mobile 
to instantly access the YouTube channel to see the latest in learning hand surgery.